Hello and welcome back to Prophecy 101. I'm your host Kendall Shoulders and today we'll be talking about uh, end times again and we'll be looking at other pictures of the harvest. In Isaiah 46, 9 through 11, he says to remember the former things of old for I am Yah and there is none else. I am Yah and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times to things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure and so from the very beginning he tells us he's telling us what the end is going to be and so we can always look at the very beginning and we can begin to decipher by inspiration of the Holy Spirit the things that are going to happen in the end now once he begins to draw these pictures for us he begins to lay it out and he begins to put the foundation down for us you can guarantee that if we've interpreted it correctly uh, those things are not not going to change he's just going to continue to build up on those things as we go throughout scripture now when we look in Genesis chapter 4 we see something that's very amazing we begin to see a whole bunch of names now if you were like me when I first began to study scripture and I see all these names and and things like that I tended to script, uh, skip over a lot of that stuff but then when I began to look at uh, uh, it go a little bit deeper then I began to understand that these names uh, carry a whole lot of deep meanings to them and so when you look at the lineage of Cain and you begin to understand that when you look at these names that it points to destruction uh, then all of a sudden all of these pictures and shadows and types begin to open up so let's look at a few things uh, in the lineage of Cain uh, we have the name Adam, which means man, Cain, which means to provoke, Enoch, which, mean, which means to train up, Irad, which means fugitive, Mahuyalel, which means smitten of God, Methushael, which means man who is of God, and Lamech means despairing, Tubal-Cain means to bring forth lament and welling as a mourning woman. In other words, it's pointing to birth pains. So if we put these names in sinner's form, we get this possibility. Man to provoke and to train up fugitives, smitten of God, who come from God while in despairing and tribulation bring forth lamenting and wailing as a mourning, wa wa as a mourning woman. So in short, Cain's lineage point to destruction and judgment by the Most High. Now, in contrast to that, we go to Genesis, the fifth chapter, and we look at the lineage of Seth, and it points to ultimate salvation. So Adam's uh, name appears again, of course, and means man. Seth means appointed. Enos means mortal. Canaan means to build a home or nest. Maha, Mahalael means praise of God. Jared means shall come down or bring down. Enoch means teaching or trained up. Methuselah means his death brings or the math of when things will go away. Lamech means despairing or tribulation. Noah means rest. So if we put these names in sentence form, we get this possibility. It says man appointed mortal to build a home or nest. The praise of God shall come down teaching. His death brings to despairing and those in tribulation rest. So when we look at both of the lenses of Cain and of Seth. Both of these lineages have an Enoch in their lineage, and both of them have a Lamech, you know, two different people in each in both lineages. Both lineages are trained up because that's what Enoch names mean. But what are they trained up in? And so when we look at the lineage of Cain, his his lineage was trained up in unrighteousness. Unrighteousness, and we look look at Seth and his lineage was trained up in righteousness. So both lineages have a segment of their people also who will go through the tribulation or despairing period, uh, you know, uh, which that was the, that's what the name of Lamech means. So the Enoch in the lineage of Cain uh, suffered damnation while the Enoch in the lineage of Seth was raptured out by God. Well, what do you mean uh, raptured out? When we look in Genesis 5th chapter, 22nd verse, it says that Enoch walked with Yah after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with Yah, and he was not, for Yah took him. So when we go to Hebrews 11 and 5, it says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because Yah had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he freed 
please Yah. So by faith now we know that uh, when he says in Genesis uh, that he took him, that he means that he took him, he raptured him out so that he should not see death. And so this is a future, uh, this is a picture of a future event that's going to happen again. You say, well, how do you know this? Well, when we go to Jude 14, and it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. So the terminology, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, is taken from the book of Enoch. And so he gives us a clue, and he said, The seventh from Adam. So when we see the seventh from Adam, then we should uh, uh, see an Enoch-type event where people are taken out without seeing death. And so what is the seventh from Adam? So we know that uh, you know this, this is going to happen. The seventh is pointing to the Sabbath, and so it has to be a Sabbath when this event happens. And so we also know that we are already six thousand years from uh, Adam. So we are six days from Adam because a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So if we're six thousand years from Adam almost, then we're right there six days, and we're about to go into the seventh day uh, which will be the 1000 millennium period and so that will be the sabbath day or the seventh day and so when, when that day hits then we should see an enoch type event happen uh, and that's why it says in jude 14 and enoch also the seventh from adam prophesied these things saying behold the lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints now another picture that i want to look at uh, is uh, coming out of Genesis 18 and we're going to focus in on uh, the salvation of Lot but we're going to look at a few details here and uh, as you know Lot is, uh, is is Abraham's nephew and he after uh, Abraham's brother died uh, he, he, he basically adopted uh, a Lot as his own and so we're going to look at uh, uh, just a little background here Lot and Abraham were living together but both uh, both men uh, were very powerful men, and their men that worked for them began to grow, you know, the people they were associated with. So they're both, both camps had a whole lot of people. And what happened, Abraham's camp and Lot's camp, the men in those camps began to, uh, to have some problems. And so Abraham decided to allow uh, Lot to pick the area of the land that he wanted to go dwell with his men with. And so Lot looked at the at the most uh, the best looking lands that he could see at that point toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and so he chose those those lands in that direction, and then Abraham went in the opposite direction. Well, make a long story short, in Genesis 18, uh, it said that uh, that that the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent uh, in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened unto the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready uh, quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon uh, the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. Alright, so this is some amazing stuff right here. So now this is, a, this is, this is an event where three men it says shows up uh, with uh, with Abraham and so he calls he calls one of the men Yahweh all right and so he's talking to him and he understands that although there are three men there there's more going on here so this is Yeshua who has manifested himself uh, in in the form of a man all right and so he's he runs out and he says let me get a little water for you I pray and he washed his feet and then they rested up under a tree 
And so after they rested up under the tree, he promised them uh, some bread. And so he tells Sarah, he said, listen, go make three measures of fine meal kneaded and make cakes up on the heart. All right. And then they go out and they fetch a calf uh, so they could kill it. And then they dressed it. And then they took butter and milk. And the calf which he addressed and said before them, he stood by them under the tree. So all these things are happening. And all these things are very prophetic. So what do you mean prophetic? Well, first of all, there's three men. And so when we fast forward a couple thousand years, we see Yeshua again, three men. Him and two other men on the cross. Then we see um, a tree. So he had them sit up under the tree. But before he did that, he washed the feet. What did the young uh, woman do with Yeshua before she, he, he went to the cross? She washed his feet. As a matter of fact, she did it twice. One time she did it uh, with the oil, and one time she did it with her tears. Then there was a sacrifice. Okay, so they took the animal and they sacrificed it. This was a picture and shadow of the sacrifice that we, Yeshua uh, uh, would make. And then, not only that, but then they went and made uh, cakes. All right, so they made cakes, uh, uh, and and but it's not just that they made cake. It said they made three measures of cakes. Why is this important? Because in Revelation six and six, the only other time where it talks about three measures is when it's talking about three measures of barley for a penny. So it's pointing to the barley harvest. All right. So then, not only that, but then it said they were eating. Uh, butter and milk and so when you begin to look up uh, butter and, 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 and milk uh, in the scripture talking about a time when the fruits of the land uh, are, are laid either laid waste or they've been harvested so this is a time where the uh, that, that, that the barley harvest and the wheat harvest are about over uh, most of the uh, barley harvest and, and, and wheat are gone and so they're having to eat the the fruit of the of the animal, which is the milk uh, and the butter. And so all of these things are pointing to a future event. Uh, not only that, but later on he goes in there and he makes a, a promise to Sarah that she's gonna have uh, she's gonna have a son in her old age. Well, she laughs about it. Well, this is this is the promise that he's making to Israel when all things seem lost. You know, it seems like uh, we've been through you know all, 2,500 years of just suffering. You know, it just you know like I think it was Jeremiah said, "Oh, were we born slaves? I mean, we just always in slavery." So it's been going on and on and on and on. And so now in our old age, will he redeem us? Will he bring us back? You know, and so these questions come up. And so the world laughs at this uh, uh, thing because the world has even replaced us with what you call a replacement theory. You know, uh, uh, this the so-called Gentile church has replaced Israel. It's over. With their, their new Israel. And so you got all these false teachings going on. And so all of these pictures and shadows and types are right here uh, in this section. And all those things are important, important leading up to uh, what's going to happen with Lot. And so what happens, it says, so uh, the Lord says, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Uh, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So now we go back to that scripture that we uh, discussed before, that the Lord had promised that he's not going to do anything unless he reveal it to his prophets first. So now he's about to uh, uh, tell Abraham what he's about to to do and in verse 20 he says and the Lord said because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come unto me and if not I will know and so then Abraham gets concerned because he understands that Lot, Lot is there and when Lot went into Sodom and Gomorrah when he went into the area he had a whole army of men and so, uh, you know, Abraham began to negotiate. He said, well, if you fin find 50 righteous in the city, uh, you know, will you destroy? Because he asked, uh, you know, uh, him the question, the first question that he asked him, if, you know, will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And he began to, 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 to negotiate. And so that begs the question, you know, will the Most High the, destroy the righteous with the wicked? And of course, that question is no. He said, so peradventure, there'd be 50 righteous within the city. 
Will thou also destroy and spare not the place for the fifty? And he said, No, I won't. I won't destroy. If you find fifty there, I'll leave him alone. All right. So he negotiates all the way down to ten. And he said, You know, and Abraham probably thinking in his mind, surely if Lot went in with this whole army, surely there's ten of them uh, that's got their heart right. And he said, Well, if I find that many, if I find ten, I won't destroy it uh, for the ten's sake. All right. So. Uh, so we we know what happens next. Uh, you know he didn't find the ten when he went in. You know he found Lot, uh, his wife and his two daughters, and his his wife in, ends up looking back and, and getting turned into a, a pillar of salt. So it ends up just being snatched out. It ends up uh, being Lot and his two daughters. So the angels go in, and I remember we called them two men before, but now. Later on in the scripture, it said they call them angels or messengers. And so these two messengers or two angels go in and they snatch out Lot uh, from the coming destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so here's another picture uh, and all of the things leading up to that. You know, uh, all the pictures and shadows that we were talking about, the tree, the three men, the cross, the sacrifice. The fact that the, uh, that, the, that the harvest was pretty much done because of the, of the uh, milk. Uh, that they used and so all these things pointing to the same thing pointing to uh, the different harvest and how the most how come in and he's going to uh, snatch out uh, his own people now another thing to understand about Lot is that he is a picture also of, of the Gentiles because he he was grafted in he was adopted you know, he was Abraham's adoptive uh, ab adopted son because he was his brother's son and he adopted him in. And this next one we'll talk about is a popular one as well. So we're going to go into Second Kings, second chapter, and we're going to look at the prophet Elijah. And uh, in this particular chapter, he had already told Elijah, his protege, that uh, you know, if if he gets the mantle, of course, uh, when it comes down, he'll get a double portion. All right, and so. Uh, in verse 10 it said that, and he said thou hast asked a hard thing nevertheless if thou shalt see me when I am taken from thee it shall be so unto thee but if not it shall not be so and it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and uh, horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven and Elijah saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of, uh, of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And so now we see another uh, picture of a snatching out. Now, this particular one, because Elijah uh, is, is one of the prophets that's expected to come back uh, as one of the two witnesses, then this this uh, you know could be a picture of, of Revelation 11, uh, but it is a an example of a righteous prophet being snatched out and not seeing death. Uh, now we'll study in a later lesson. We will study Elijah and we'll study Enoch because these two are are due to come back, Elijah and Enoch, and these are are the two witnesses that we see in Revelation 11. And so we'll study that a little bit more. And when you study scripture, you'll begin to see something really interesting going on with Elijah and Enoch. Uh, these two characters continue to show up all throughout scripture. They don't name them every time, but they're always there behind the scene. And so we'll talk about that uh, at a future date. But I want you to see uh, Elijah being taken out without seeing death. And so for Elijah and Enoch, uh, in these, in, you know, up until this point, are the only two that have been taken out without seeing death. Now, another interesting picture is in the book of Daniel. And so we know that in the book of Daniel, Daniel had went into captivity uh, after the Babylonians had, had come in and, and taken over uh, Judah. All right, so um, we see this, and we also remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All right. So in Daniel's second chapter, we see the character Daniel. We see the prophet Daniel, uh, and he's he's being put in charge of some things. And then in chapter 3, you know, because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are also put in charge of some things, 
all of a sudden we see Daniel disappear. We don't see him anymore. Now this is not as obvious, but you would think that if, if Daniel was in chapter 2, that he was also be in chapter 3, but he's nowhere to be found. And this is the chapter where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, uh, won't bow down and worship uh, uh, the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And so you would think that Daniel would be there too because he's not going to bow down and worship either. But for some reason, he mysteriously disappears in this chapter. Now, I believe that it's it's some type of picture uh, a shadow of things to come. Why did I say that? Because when you look in Daniel 3 and you begin to see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you begin to see other pictures as well. And so when you look at Nebuchadnezzar, then it begins to be obvious then that he is a picture of the Antichrist that's going to show up in the book of Revelation uh, 13 chapter. But why you say it's because when you look in, in uh, Nebuch uh, Daniel the third chapter, let's look at it. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth of, of six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So when you look at three score cubits, a score is 20. And so when you multiply uh, it, it's three score, that's 60. So you got 60 cubits, and then you got, it's a breadth, the height was 60 cubits, and then the breadth was six cubits. So you got, he's pointing to 666. It's not exactly 666, but it's pointing to 666, because it's three score, you got a 660, and then you got a breadth of a six. So it's pointing to the image uh, of the beast in Revelation 13, where, the, where that uh, image of uh, the number of his name is going to be 666. Not only that, <clears throat> but it also talks about him setting up kings and princes and governors and captains and judges. And so we know that when the Antichrist comes, he's going to have ten kings that he's he, that's going to be set up during that time. Uh, three will uh, end up getting uh, killed or devoured, and so he'll end up having seven. Uh, not only that, but it also... Uh, at that time, it said, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, uh, they fell down and they worshipped the image. So we know that in Revelation, that's part of the issue. You have to worship the image. You have the beast and his image in order uh, and, and take the mark so that you can eat and so you can survive. You know, but what's, what's so interesting about this particular text is that it names six instruments. Uh, you know, you got the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and then all kinds of music. So he named six uh, things. So you end up, uh, well, in verse 5 it names six. It says the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer. So those are six instruments that's, that's named. And when those six instruments play, everybody will fall down and worship the image. So when you go back to the height, which is three score cubits, which is 60, and then you go to the breadth of it, which is six cubits, and then you got six musicians playing, then we know that Nebuchadnezzar, because you got 666, or 66 and 6, uh, that's pointing to the Antichrist. So it's all pointing to the same, uh, same thing. So that's important because uh, when we look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are pointing to uh, the part of Israel that will encounter or run into the Antichrist. When we begin to look at Revelation 13 and 14, and we see uh, Judah stand up and fight. And Judah's going to stand up and fight, and he's not going to take the mark. And, and um, a lot of Judah will be slaughtered, uh, but also that Judah will be transitioned. Uh, and, and get their new bodies, and they will rule and reign with the Most High uh, during that thousand-year period. So it's not it's not a bad slaughter; it's a good slaughter. All right. And so in verse eleven, it says, "Whoso falleth not down and worship, that he should be cast into the midst of a, a, a he shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace." So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not do it; they refused to do it. This is what's going to happen with Judah; they just going to refuse to do it. And because of that, he told them to turn the fire up seven times hotter. So we also know that the um, arrival of the Antichrist will most likely happen at the end of a uh, 
of a of a jubilee cycle so it'd be the last seven years of a jubilee cycle and so for the first three and a half years everybody's gonna think this is the real messiah you know judah's gonna be fooled for three and a half years they're gonna think because he's gonna have all signs all uh you know uh lying wonders the scriptures say so he's gonna be able to do everything that uh messiah done when he was here the first time with the exception of raising people from the dead and so he's gonna have all these signs so we're gonna be fooled at first until he begins to slaughter the people for not uh bowing down to the image so you had this same thing going on with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They refused to do it, so he turns it up seven times harder, pointing to that last seven years uh, uh, that we're going to have with this Antichrist. So it's, it's that seven years, then you got to seven times harder, and so you have these images, all these images there. And so they refused to do it. And in the midst of them going through the fire, they didn't suffer through that tribulation period because there was a fourth uh, image that shows up in the middle of the fire. Now, every all of the evil people that threw them in there, when they got close to the furnace, they burned up. Uh, the heat burned them, but uh, Chatrat, Mesh Meshach, and Abednego were protected supernaturally during that tribulation period. And of course, we read scriptures in the last lesson to how that's what's going to happen with Israel during that that period of that time, that seven year period, or the end of that seventeen year period. When it gets really, really bad, Israel is going to be supernaturally protected. And so we see all of those images there. So I thought that was interesting that Daniel uh, disappeared uh, for this particular chapter. And then all of a sudden, uh, the other three uh, were going through. Now, another scripture that's interesting to look at, uh, Isaiah 57. And he's talking about the ultimate, ultimate judge judgment of the world and he's saying the righteous perishes so he's talking about the righteous righteous die and or and no man led to heart and then he says something else he said and the merciful men are taken away so now he's pointing to a snatching out so the righteous perishes that means some are going to die by the sword and no man led to heart nobody's paying attention that all these people that are dying are righteous people and merciful men are taken away and so being snatched out, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. And so what he's doing, what he's saying is that when you begin to really study these pictures, shadows, types, and you begin to study these feast days and all these things, you'll, you'll understand that all of, the, all of the people who are supposed to be taken out will be taken out during these feast, feast days. And... All of the people that are supposed to be protected will be protected by the time that the day of the Lord really comes in and he deals with uh, the Gentiles, basically. He's going to deal with the nations. And so those last few years are to deal with the nations. And so he's saying that they hadn't even noticed that the merciful men are taken away and the righteous are being taken away from the evil to come. So by the time he really gets turns the heat up, None of his people would be here either by death and having gotten a new body or being taken away. And this is what this scripture alludes to. Now, just to back that up a little bit, we're going to go talk about the thief. All right, in Luke 12, 36 through 40. All right, <clears throat> and he says, And ye yourself like unto men that wait for the Lord, wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knock it, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, find watching. Very last say unto you that all that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Now this is, <laughs> listen, if you don't understand the feast days, you don't understand the, 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 the different harvests and all that, this is going to go right over your head. All right, so he's saying, he, what's so brilliant about this? He's saying in verse 33 that he's returning from a wedding which tells us that the first watch has already taken place. 
first watch is, is done because he's been in the wedding. He's, he's, he's brought in a bride. All right. All right. So then he says that if he shall come in the second watch. Okay. So he's, 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 he's telling us that, you know, that there's some righteousness going to come in the second watch. He's, he's already taken the first watch. There's some that's going to come in the second watch. And there's also some going to come in the third watch. And he said, these are, are blessed. He said, because if you miss the first one, you, you're going to be watching for the second one. And you also, if you miss the second, you're going to be watching for this third one. And he said, you know, and find them so blessed are those servants. So he's letting us know that all of those that belong to him, the elect, will go in one of these three watches. He said, because if you are watching this thing, you begin to know what's going on. You're not going to allow your house. Uh, to be broken through. You're going to be in one of those watches. All right, well, watch this. So then we go down, we go to uh, First Thessalonians. And he says something again. He says, verse 3, uh, chapter 5, verse 3. He says, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in dark. Now he's talking about the elect. That that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So he's saying that if you if you're watching and sober, uh, it can't come up on you like a thief. The only one that should come up on like a thief are those who are in darkness. All right. I'm going to read that again. He said, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that they should overtake you as a thief. All right. So, now, that doesn't mean that you might not miss one of the watches if you're his. That means you wasn't watching at that particular time. But because of the way the harvest is structured, if you are his, you're going to make one of those uh, watch, watches. You, know, you got the first, he called it the first watch, second watch, third watch. He says, so therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath. That's not our appointment. You look at the appointed days, the festival. That's not our appointment. He said, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. All right, so uh, th that's very important information right there. So when we break those down, then you begin to understand. So we can start looking at all these different parables now, and we can, be we can begin to get a better understanding because now we understand that there's a first, second, third watch. We begin to understand that there's different hours that he comes in and he gathers people in. So we, we begin to understand concepts and and, and, and and all these based upon what we've been teaching in the first uh, three lessons. There's a lot more to go, but I, I, I want to give us this basic foundation so we can understand these other scriptures as we encounter them, and especially as we go into uh, talking about uh, more about the book of Revelation go in the end times these concepts are very important for us to understand so we can extract out uh, some of the pictures and shadows and the deeper things uh, that the Most High want us to get now that being said I want to look at this one last scripture before we get out of here and it's in Jeremiah 8 and I'm just going to read verse 16 through 22 and I want to see if you catch it when I read it and he's talking to to uh, Israel and he's telling us how we're going kick, to get kicked out of the land particularly Judah and he's talking to us and he's going to say something about the harvest I want to see if you catch it he said the snoring of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong one. For they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. He said, for behold, I will send serpents 
cockatrices among you, which will not be charmed. In other words, you can't talk them out of it. And they shall bite you, said the Lord. When I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Behold, the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people, because of them that dwell in a far country. Now he's talking about us being dispersed. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people and my hurt, I am black astonishment, had taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Did you catch that in verse 20? He said, the harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. So he's saying that the, that the barley harvest is gone. The wheat harvest is gone. The summer ended. And still we're not saved. So he's pointing to those harvests and he's letting Israel know that these are going to be some of the things that we miss. Our people as a whole are going to miss. Because the summer has ended and we should have been saved during the summer. And we were not. The harvest has passed. The summer has ended. And yet we are not saved. So, uh, I'm going to end this lesson right here and we'll go into uh, some other items similar to this as we, as we move forward, as, as I'm led by the Most High. But I just wanted to point out some things to you in the scripture where he's drawing uh, all these pictures and he's in these shadows and types for us to begin to understand. Like he said, he's declaring the end from the beginning and, and from ancient times and things. Uh, that are not yet done and so he's he's talking to us and he's showing us and he's breaking it down to us and and he's revealing knowledge so that we can begin to understand those deeper things as we search uh search these things out so uh you know like i said uh I, a lot of these shadows and pictures i put in uh in my books uh you know, a lot of, a lot of it I haven't, so I, I'll have to write. I'll probably have to write a couple more books just to uh, help out. But if you want to uh, order one of the books, I'll put the link down into uh, description section. And you know, the price on is Amazon for the, for the old book that I got. It's got a whole lot of pictures and shadows in it. Uh, it's just three dollars. You can download download it off of Amazon. And if you don't have a Kindle, you can uh, download the Kindle app. And then you can still read it. You can after you download the Kindle app, then you can still buy it from Amazon and download it for for three dollars. Or you can get the other book uh, called Yeshua Is a Worm, and it's also got that book included as a bonus on the inside of it, where we're talking about pictures and shadows in that book as well. And so hopefully, you know, most high willing, I'll uh, I'll write another couple of books and discuss some other pictures and shadows. That will help us begin to decipher uh, some of these scriptures. But anyway, if you have any questions, hit me up. Let me know. And you all be blessed in the most high.